When Christ reached Calvary, there was no substitute. He was indeed the lamb that God provided, and no one or no thing could have taken his place upon that cross. Good morning again. Good morning. Again. <laughs> Let's go ahead and open in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come to you today as servants, as humble sinners who desire only to do your will, to worship you in a manner that is worthy, that brings you and you alone the glory. As we come to your precious word this morning, would you use it to humble our minds that we may know you truly? Use it to warm our hearts that we would love you deeply. And Lord, use it to strengthen our hands that we may do your bidding. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. On April 10th, 1912, after nearly three years of construction, a ship, one of its kind and the crown jewel of its creators, set sail from Southampton, England, on its maiden voyage across the Atlantic. Only four days into its journey, tragedy struck. The ship, at full speed, collided with an iceberg in the late hours of the night. Instantly, the impact sent rivets that held together the ship's hull plummeting into the depths of the sea. And a jagged spur on the iceberg slashed a nearly 300-foot gash into the side of the boat. She was doomed. Crew members and captain took the burden upon their back and began feverishly working to slow the inevitable. Unfortunately, it was too late and lifeboats were dropped and passengers with their most valued possessions in hand began making their way to these lifeboats. Only these lifeboats couldn't carry everybody. Only a few people could get on, let alone any goods that they might be carrying. So maybe not so eagerly, but willingly, the people began throwing their favorite clothing and jewelry, pictures and sentimental items into the icy water, sacrificing their most valued possessions to the sea in order that they might be spared. And of the 2,223 passengers aboard the Titanic, the lifeboats could carry only 706 of them to safety. Those 706 survivors directly owed their lives to the 1,517 people who took their place upon the death-bound ship. Some of those people even willingly relinquished their seats on those lifeboats so that others might be spared. And you see, this is very similar to what we find with Abraham and Isaac in Genesis chapter 22. After 25 years of waiting for the promise of God, Abraham finally receives his son, the son of the promise, his crown jewel, who, much like the Titanic, was to carry his people to the land and blessings promised by God. However, they too struck an iceberg. And this divine iceberg was in the form of a command from God to take Isaac and sacrifice him as a burnt offering to the Lord. So obediently, Abraham and Isaac set off to the land of Moriah. Isaac, like the crew members, willingly carrying the, the wood for his sacrifice upon his own back. Abraham, willingly laying his most valued possession on the altar to sacrifice similar to what the passengers did with their most valued possessions. And Isaac, like the 706 survivors, placed his trust and ultimately lived through another who was willing to take his place. So if you have not already done so, would you turn with me to Genesis chapter 22? Genesis chapter 22, and I'd like to extract three truths from this text. Uh, we're picking up here with Abraham and Isaac, and they have already arrived at the place of which God told them to go and sacrifice Isaac. So follow along as I read verses 6 through 8. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. 
And this brings us to our first truth, to take up your cross. Now we who have the benefit of living in the new covenant have the blessing of being able to look backwards at this event and see the incredible picture being painted of Christ and what he accomplished for us. We can see the similarities between Abraham laying the wood for the burnt offering upon his son Isaac and God the Father laying the cross upon Christ, both of them being led up the mountain to be sacrificed. The difference, of course, is that when Isaac reached the top of the mountain, God provided a lamb to be his substitute. When Christ reached Calvary, there was no substitute. He was indeed the lamb that God provided, and no one or no thing could have taken his place upon that cross. But what I want to do is look practically at these verses, taking what Isaac did all those years ago and make it applicable to our lives here in the 21st century to show how we too, like Isaac, may have to carry our own sacrifice upon our back, may have to take up our own cross upon our back in our Christian life. So what then does it mean to take up our cross? Jesus tells us in Luke 9, 23, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. You see, the taking up of one's cross carries the idea of, of sacrifice, of denying yourself, of making a complete and radical commitment to God's will for you. The great theologian Arthur W. Pink said it this way, Taking up my cross means a life voluntarily surrendered to God. And this is exactly what we see with Isaac. And I don't know about you, but whenever I picture this narrative in my head, I picture Isaac as a very small child, probably not able to fully grasp what's really going on here, just blindly following his father. Um, and though we are not given his exact age during the time of these events, we are given some clues that can help us figure out a general idea of how old he was. And many scholars would argue that he was actually a young man at the time of this event, somewhere between the ages of 18 and 25. And if that's indeed the case, Isaac knew full well where they were going. He knew full well what he was carrying upon his back and what was going to happen to him at the top of that mountain. Um, but yeah, he was, he was indeed trusting in his father Abraham, but not only Abraham. He was trusting in his heavenly father. No matter how he felt, scared, hurt, maybe a little bit confused, he was surrendering all of that to God's will for him. So what is the cross that we are to take up? What does it look like for us? For Isaac, it was the wood on which he was to be sacrificed and burned. For Christ, it was the cross under which he was to be nailed. For us, it could very well be the instruments of our own martyrdom in more severe persecuted Christians' cases. But more likely, for us in this room, it could be any affliction or trial through which we suffer for the sake of Christ. And my friends, far too many of us today live for the here and now, selfishly seeking our own comfort, chasing our own desires. And what we fail to recognize is that God has promised us eternal life, he never promised us an easy life. There will be times when God will call us to take up our cross. There will be times when God himself will lay a cross upon our back, whether it be affliction or trial or suffering or maybe punishment. But we must not cast it off for the sake of our own comfort. Instead, we need to hear the words of Christ and take up our cross, deny ourselves for the sake of his glory. And the next time we find ourselves called by God to take up a cross, we must be like Isaac and voluntarily carry the burden of our own sacrifice upon our back. Ultimately, trusting in the will of God for our lives and always remembering this, that Christ has already borne the heaviest end of that cross. Christ is our surety. If you have placed your trust in him, he has already accomplished salvation on your behalf. He has already carried the ultimate cross. And because of that cross and the one who was nailed to it, we stand justified before the Lord. Allow that to strengthen you, encourage you, embolden you in your own afflictions. And believe me, 
I know some of you are carrying a cross right now. I know that. And I am not making light of any of your situations. I know the burden well of having a cross laid upon your back. When you feel the, the weight of it pressing down upon your shoulders, when you feel the rough wood of it pressing splinters into your flesh, when you feel as though your very bones may give out and crush under its weight, but hear me, all of that weight, all of that suffering was already borne upon the shoulders of your strong Savior, Christ. And you know, of course, who Simon of Cyrene was. He was the man that the Roman soldiers forced to help Christ carry his cross up Calvary. Uh, well, much like Simon helped Christ bear that burden up the mountain, for us as believers, Christ himself will be there to aid you in whatever cross you are carrying right now. Trust in him. And this leads us to our second truth. To tie your sin upon the altar. Follow along as I read verses 9 and 10. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the, alt built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. Wow! I think it's really easy to forget that these are real people. These events actually took place. They are not just stories. And can you imagine what Isaac must have felt as he watched the glistening blade of his father's knife raise above his head? It must have felt as though time itself stopped as he waited for that knife to plunge down with all its sharpened edges into his flesh. And Abraham, Abraham was about to kill the promise that he received from God. The son, his only son, whom he loved, whom he and Sarah had prayed desperately for. And by all indications in the text, they remained calm and composed. I don't know about you, but I can barely compose myself when my daughter gets a paper cut. <laughs> Abraham, he was about to take a knife and slaughter his son. Unbelievers will by no doubt, and I've heard them use this, they will say this proves that God is a cruel God. How could he ask him to do that? But we as humbled believers will recognize this on Abraham and Isaac's part as an incredible act of trust and faith in God's will. In fact, this is the very fruit of Abraham's faith that proved him to be a true believer. In Romans 4, 3, we learn that Abraham was justified by faith. And Paul tells us, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Referring, of course, to the covenant made a few chapters earlier between God and Abraham. But then James, in his epistle, takes this a bit further, and he shows us this, this act of offering up Isaac on Mount Moriah was the work that evidenced the reality of Abraham's faith, that it showed it as being living and active and true as opposed to dead and a spoken faith only. James tells us, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So indeed, we have to talk about this incredible obedience on Abraham and Isaac's part. However, for today, I don't believe God is going to ask any one of us to offer up our children as a burnt offering. There is something that he does ask each and every one of us to lay upon the altar. And that is our sin. And you may be saying, well, Abraham didn't offer sin on the altar. He offered Isaac, and Isaac wasn't a sin. I know that. But what I pray that you will understand is that Abraham took something that he loved, that he cherished with his whole heart, and he laid it upon the altar, fully intent on destroying it for the sake of obeying the Lord's command. And we all, as fallen and sinful individuals, have a sin that we cherish above all others. We have a sin that we hold in our heart, 
This is called our besetting sin or our bosom sin. And if you want to know what that looks like for you, listen to this quote by Thomas Watson where he tells us what a bosom sin is. He says, That sin which has most power over a man and most easily leads him captive is the beloved of his soul. There are some sins which a man can better put off and repulse, but there is one sin which, if it becomes a suitor, he cannot deny, but is overcome by it. This is the bosom sin. And we as believers, we cannot allow this bosom sin to remain in us. We cannot assume that if we put on a shell of outward Christianity, that we can joyfully retain some sin that we're holding on to, that we're cherishing. In fact, this reminds me of a story I once heard about road rage. See, <laughs> none of you know anything about that. A light turned yellow, and the man at the front of the traffic stopped at the crosswalk. You know, he did the right thing. Uh, much to the dismay of the tailgating woman who was behind him, uh, who immediately began to honk her horn, screaming in frustration at the man. She was already running late, and now she had missed her opportunity to get through that pesky light. Well, about midway through her rant, she hears a tap on the window. And looking up, she sees the face of a very serious police officer. He says, ma'am, I need you to exit the car with your hands on top of your head. He arrests her. And after a few hours, scary, frustrating hours in the holding cell, she's escorted back to the booking desk where the arresting officer is waiting there with all her personal belongings. Still fuming, she begins berating this poor man. I demand to know why you arrested me. Did you just arrest me because I was angry like you've never been angry before? Well, very calmly, this officer replied, Ma'am, I'm sorry for the mistake. But I pulled up behind you as you were screaming, honking your horn, cursing out the man in front of you. I then noticed the What Would Jesus Do bumper sticker, <laughs> the Jesus Saves license plate holder, and the chrome-plated Christian fish emblem on your trunk. So naturally, I assumed you had stolen the car. <laughs> <laughs> But in all seriousness, <laughs> our best outward Christian appearance does not justify our holding on to sin. These bosom sins must be sacrificed. Anything, anything at all that we hold above our love for the Lord Jesus must be killed at all costs. For if this is true, if indeed God has provided the ultimate substitute, the ultimate propitiation for our sins, then how dare we? How dare we hold anything above our love for him, especially a sin, a sin for which he died and bled for on your behalf? May it not be so. The Puritan minister, William Gurnall, in his massive and brilliant work entitled The Christian in Complete Armor, says this, and I already hit the slide. Soul, take your lust, your only lust, which is the child of your dearest love, your Isaac, the sin which has caused most joy and laughter, from which you have promised yourself the greatest return of pleasure or profit. If ever you look to see my God's face with comfort, lay hands on it and offer it up, Pour out the blood of it before me. Run the sacrificing, sacrificing knife of mortification into the very heart of it and do this freely, joyfully, for it is no pleasing sacrifice that is offered with a countenance cast down. Do all this now before you have one more embrace from it. So I urge you, for the sake of God's command, for the sake of the Lamb who took our place, show the obedience of Abraham. Tie up that sin which you hold so dear. Place it upon the altar and destroy it before it destroys you. But I warn you, you brave and faithful few who are venture to do this, that sin which is the beloved of your soul will not die without a fight. Again, Grinnell writes, whoops, there we go. Our lust will not lie so patiently upon the altar as Isaac, or as a lamb that is brought to the slaughter which is dumb, but will roar and shriek 
yea, even shake and rend the heart with its hideous outcries. But stand fast, Christian. Listen not to these lies, these shrieks and roars from the sin that you hold inside of you. Instead, every time you hear it pleading with you, let your ears instead hear the voice of Christ crying out upon that cross in agony. It is finished. And remember what it was that he finished on our behalf. And this leads us to our third and final truth. Trust in the Lamb who took your place. Follow along as I read verses 11 through 14. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Now notice how just in the nick of time, God comes down and stops Abraham. The angel of the Lord, who I believe Rick talked about this in his sermon last week, the angel of the Lord many a times is referring to Christ, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ himself. And I believe that's who this was, who came down and stopped Abraham's hand at the last minute. It's all very cinematic. I mean, how often in movies does the hero dive through the window just before the bomb explodes? Or the damsel in distress is snatched from the track just before the train runs her over? So God is the ultimate cinematographer. Those guys are all just stealing from our book. But as cinematic as this all plays out, I can assure you Isaac would have been happy if God had stopped it a little sooner than he actually did. And as dramatic as it is, I promise that the omniscient, all-knowing God knew full well what he was doing. He had no intention of letting the son of the promise be killed on that altar that day. So you may ask yourself, why? Why did Abraham and Isaac have to go through such a traumatic trial? Was it simply to really test Abraham's faith and see whether or not he truly feared God? Well, partly, yes. But I would argue that this all-knowing God also knew full well what was in Abraham's heart before he did it. He knew the decision he would make ahead of time. So what I'd like to do today is look at this from a New Testament perspective. And in that light, I submit that the theme of this entire drama being played out in Genesis 22 is all about Christ and what he accomplished on our behalf. You see, this is a direct, what they call a typology. It's a typology of what Christ does for us in salvation. So allow me to retell this story, um, removing some of the characters and interjecting you and I into the place of Isaac. So we all, because of our sin against a holy and just God, find ourselves tied up upon an altar. And because our God is indeed holy and just, he demands a payment of blood for our wickedness, for our sin. Hebrews 9.22 tells us, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But as much as he is holy and just, he is also merciful and gracious. And just before he plunges that knife of all of his holy wrath into our sinful flesh, he stops. And instead of claiming his vengeance against us who deserve it, he sends his son, the perfect lamb, to be our substitute. And that lamb, Jesus Christ, much like Isaac, willingly climbs up upon that altar and receives the full impact of that knife. He swallows the entire cup of God's wrath against our sin. And in doing this, God's great mercy and grace are shown and demonstrated by his love in sending his own son to die in our place and that son willingly taking our place upon that cross. But also, God's holiness and justice are satisfied 
because the bomb of holy hatred that God aims towards our lawlessness is detonated upon the precious, innocent, righteous head of his lamb. Do we truly, truly understand what this means? In the seventh chapter of his book, the prophet Micah, speaking of God's love and compassion, says this, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever, because he delights in steadfast love. But then he says this, he will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Now we can understand when Micah talks about this iniquity being tread underfoot, that he is referring to Christ. You see, Christ becomes our iniquity. And he was trampled brutally underfoot so that we might have all our sins cast into the depths of the sea. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 that for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. The perfect, spotless Lamb of God became sin on our behalf and was crushed, trampled, tread upon also that we sinners might live eternally. And what I really want you to understand today is that when we fully grasp the reality of what Christ accomplished on our behalf, it will encourage, strengthen, embolden us to live accordingly. The final truth of trusting in the Lamb who took our place is the glue that holds the other two truths together. Once we realize that he has taken the punishment we all deserve, then we will be delighted when we are asked to take up our cross, and we will be determined to tie down our sin. I implore you to live in such a way that reflects your gratitude for this incredible act of mercy and sacrifice by our Lord. And I pray that the Lamb who paid the ultimate price would be your central motivation in all that you do. I want to leave you today with some words from John Bunyan's classic, The Pilgrim's Progress. And in the end of part two, the character named Mr. Standfast arrives at the river. Now in The Pilgrim's Progress, the river symbolizes our crossing from death into life when they cross that river, an entrance into the celestial city, which represents heaven. And when Mr. Standfast gets about waist deep in that water, he, turn around, he turns around to the other standing on the shore and speaks. And he doesn't speak about going to see the streets paved with gold. He doesn't talk about seeing the grandeur of the pearly gates, not even going to see those loved ones who have passed on before him. But rather, he says this, I see myself now at the end of my journey. My toilsome days are ended. I am going now to see that head that was crowned with thorns and that face that was spit upon for me. May that forever be our goal, to be joined with the one who took our place. With our eyes, behold that precious head that was crowned with thorns and to weep with inexpressible gratitude before that face that was spit upon for us. Let that be your joy. Let that be your comfort. Let that be your surety in both life and death, not only as an assurance of your faith and salvation, but as an encouragement to take the cross upon your back, to tie your sin upon the altar, and ultimately to trust in the lamb that God has provided. Let's pray. Father God, we ever truly know the depths of your love, the sacrifice you made. How could you possibly have loved us so much that you would send your precious, righteous, and perfect son to die in our place for the sins that we committed? Oh, how unsearchable and limitless are the depths of your mercy, 
and grace and steadfast love. Lord, would you help each one of us as we leave here today always remember what it means that Christ took our place upon that cross and for his sake be willing to take up our own cross, be willing to sacrifice our own sin so that you would be glorified. And we ask you this in the name of the precious Lamb, our substitute, Jesus Christ. Amen.